and welcome to Sage Politics Web Webinar Week. Today's webinar is called Teaching the Politics of Development When All Development is Political, presented by Claire McLaughlin, Samin Ali, Nick Cheeseman, and David Hudson, who are all based at the University of Birmingham. My name is Fawzi Eastwood, and I'm a marketing manager at Sage for the Politics Books Portfolio. I'm a cisgender woman of South Asian background. I have medium length brown hair and brown eyes, and I'm wearing a black sweater. My pronouns are she, her. Before we start, I'd like to share some webinar housekeeping information for you. We're recording this webinar. However, we switched off the cameras and muted the microphones for all participants except the presenters and the hosts. This is so that everyone will be able to enjoy the session without background noise. The chat, the chat box won't be available for participants during this webinar. If you do have any questions, do please write them in the Q&A box. And you'll find that at the bottom of your screen. And we'll reply to as many of those as we can during the session with some answered live by the presenters. And then we'll try to follow up with any that we didn't get around to answering today. I would urge you to please take advantage of our presenters expertise and focus any questions you may have around the content of today's webinar. As mentioned, the webinar is being recorded and we'll upload the recorded video on Sage's YouTube channel over the coming weeks. We'll also share it via email and, our, on, and on our X page. We've made closed captions available during this webinar, so do switch those on if they're helpful for you. Sage is a global academic publisher of books, journals, and library resources with a growing range of technologies to enable discovery, access, and engagement. Our mission is building bridges to knowledge, supporting the development of ideas through the research process to scholarship that is certified, taught, and applied across all fields of social science. Whether you're preparing to teach a course, conducting research, or looking to publish your next research paper, our Sage Politics and International Relations portfolios provide top quality, easy to access materials to help you make the best use of your time and excel in your field. We're delighted to introduce today's webinar, which is on the theme of teaching the politics of development with our lineup of editor, authors, and experts in the field. Their upcoming book, their, their upcoming SAGE textbook is called The Politics of Development, and it comes out at the end of this month. This will be referenced to during the webinar. You can find out more about their book at our website. Um, that's on the next screen um, at the website www.sagepub.co.uk, or if you scan the QR code. And attendees of today's webinar can get 25% discount using the code POLWEBWEEK, or if you're a lecturer, you can request an electronic inspection copy. Now, without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome and introduce our presenters today. Claire McLaughlin is an Associate Professor of Politics and Development and former Director of Research for the Developmental Leadership Programme, an international collaboration researching politics, power and agency in development. Dr McLaughlin has over a decade's experience of advising bilateral and multilateral aid agencies on the politics of vital public service delivery and has published widely on this, including influential research on the links between service delivery and state legitimation in conflict afflicted areas such as Sri Lanka and the Pacific Islands. A cre creative educator, Claire led the development of the International Development Department's first undergraduate programs in politics and development launched in 2020. Samin Ali is assistant professor in international development before which she was an assistant professor at the Lahore University of Management Sciences in Pakistan. Her published work, which includes a series of articles in leading journals, has broken new ground by using bureaucratic politics as a lens to understand patterns of governance and service delivery, citizens' experience of state services such as immunization and the implementation of donor-led reform programs. Nick Cheeseman is the director of the Center for Elections, Democracy, Accountability and Representation, and was formerly the director of the African Studies Center at the University of Oxford. An award-winning author of more than 10 books and 40 journal articles, he was, he was recently awarded the Joni Lovenduski Prize for Outstanding Professional Achievement by Political Studies Association of the United Kingdom, and the Celebrating Impact Prize of the Economic and Social Research Council for Outstanding International Impact. David Hudson is the head of the International Development Department and a lead investigator on two large projects, the Developmental Leadership Programme and the Development Engagement Lab, which tracks public attitudes towards global developmental challenges. A leading voice on aid and the politics of development, his articles have been published in leading journals based on fieldwork in Fiji, France, the Gambia, Germany, 
Indonesia, Jamaica, Myanmar, Rwanda, Senegal, Solomon Islands, the UK and the US. And it's so wonderful to have you with us today, um, all of you. And over to you, Claire, Samin, Nick and David. Okay, thank you Fawzia for that um, very generous introduction. And thank you all for coming. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar today. In fact, we've been quite overwhelmed already by the positive responses we've had to the book. Um, so over the next hour or so, we hope we can give you a flavor of some of the things we feel it can contribute to learning, teaching, and ultimately practicing or doing uh, the politics of development. So the book comes out of our experience of working together at the International Development Department in the School of Government at the University of Birmingham. Um, as a department, we represent a range of disciplinary, methodological, regional and country expertise. Um, but what we really share is this commitment to exploring development as a political process and bringing this to life in the classroom. Um, I think because of this kind of shared commitment, the process of the writing of the book was actually remarkably seamless, um, somewhat seamless, um, due to you know, this dedication of our colleagues and of course our wonderful editors and team of um, people who worked on the book at SAGE. It was, however, um, more realistically, also um, challenging and no mean feat. And I think the numbers here kind of speak for themselves. Five editors, 21 contributors, and so on. And um, one of the important stories behind these numbers is the classroom trials, the two classroom trials that I've listed there. It was really important for us um, to make sure that this book is really anchored in our experience of teaching at both postgraduate and undergraduate levels. Um, <clears throat> and so the book was kind of co-produced with students in at least two senses. I mean, first of all, their curiosity, their kind of intellectual thirst for knowledge really um, inspired the book in the first place. And secondly, their kind of practical engagement in the process of developing the book, I think, made it better. So we had a few conversations. They read drafts of the book and they told us exactly what they liked, what they didn't like, what they thought we could explain better or differently. Um, they weren't shy about telling us that. And it really did improve, we think, um, the final product. IDD, our department, has been teaching students since 1964 and learning um, from students about how to teach development in ways that can really encourage that kind of critical reflection. And in fact, this also means that we are in our 60th year and it is our birthday this year. So the development of the book has happily coincided with our celebration of our 60 years of teaching and learning as a department. I suppose in that sense, you could say that the book, The Politics of Development, has actually been 60 years in the making. Um, now, I put on there, we didn't have any arguments with each other. I mean, we didn't have any full-blown arguments. There were some near misses. And those of you um, who are joining the call, who are contributors to the book, you know who you are. Um, but certainly, it was a, um, a process of contestation, as all books should be, in, in terms of generating knowledge that can be contested, looking at different ways of expressing and exploring knowledge. And one of the kind of core puzzles, if not the core puzzle, that motivates the book is this one, this idea that everything about development is political. In fact, it's, it's quite hard to imagine that there can be any development without politics. Um, in the book, right from the outset, first part of chapter one, we set up this puzzle by thinking about all the actors, interests, power dynamics, contestation that occurred around the development of the sustainable development goals, for example, as a kind of case in point. 
But actually, politics and development are entangled at really all levels of society, whether it's about de defining the goal of development or actually delivering it in practice. In fact, sometimes in the classroom, as a kind of thought experiment, an experiment in class, we would ask students to think about and to try to come up with something that happens as part of development that is not political. And many of them will, of course, go to the most extremely technocratic um, thing that they can imagine. For example, building road, because it's just making stuff. It's just materials, right? It's just workers. It's an engineering task. And so we use this as a way to challenge their starting viewpoints, to challenge them to unpack the various ways in which politics penetrates even the most technocratic or seemingly technocratic processes. So in this case, with the case of roads, do the workers have rights? Who decides? Who has the power to decide whether those workers have rights? Where does the investment come from, the World Bank or China? Who wins the contracts? Does it go to the best bidder or the ones with the highest, with the best political connections? Where does the road go? Who does it serve? Does it serve the local MP's house or does it board, benefit the broader community? And so on and so forth. So we can clearly demonstrate to students right from the start in examples like this, that when we think about the function and the output of politics and the function and the output of development, it's very hard to disentangle them. As Adrian Lefwich put it, that's because the purpose of politics is to organize and express the interaction of people, resources, and power. And development too cannot happen without interaction between those things. So all of that might seem really logical, and most of us here will have already bought into the idea that development is political. It's a simple, deceptively simple maybe truth. But it raises another challenge, we think, for students and for educators and for thinkers in this sector, and that is this. If everything about development is political, what then is the politics of development? Why do we have modules that have the prefix politics of development or politics of international development? Why don't we just have development modules? If everything about development is political, where does the politics of development start and end? Because to define it as everything is to define it as nothing. And ultimately, if you're a student, what are you signing up to when you sign up for a program or a module about the politics of development? What can you expect? And of course, we know that the answer to this question is very much shaped in the academy by different disciplinary vantage points. So you may perceive if you're an economist that roads are built for growth. If you're a sociologist, maybe they're built for social cohesion or conflict resolution. You know, ultimately though, we don't think these disciplinary silos give a very good answer to what the politics of development is or how we should think about it. And we think we need a more specific way of thinking about the politics of development. It has to be more than the sum of these fragmented parts, essentially. But then this raises the question, what is the politics of development? Where does it happen? What does it look like? How can we analyze and understand it better? This is really what the book is about. And this is kind of the thing that we want to answer today in this webinar. So we're gonna talk about what is the politics of development, how we've resolved that challenge, how we can analyze politics of development and give students the kind of tools to do that. And some of the features of the book that we think help us on that pedagogical journey. So I'm gonna hand over to David to begin part one. Thanks, Claire. Um, and yeah, like uh, like Claire, thank you all for coming uh, this evening or this morning, where whatever time it is where you are. So I'll take this first one, um, trying to answer that question that Claire set up in terms of what is the politics of development. Um, one thing that um, Claire did was went, go through a number of different um, modules and programs that teach on uh, the politics of development and has created this uh, word cloud on the next slide. 
And as we can see here, there's a real diversity of the ways that the politics of development is framed. Um, then, you know, we have here development as an outcome, like a set of goals, like ending poverty, rights, reducing hunger, growth, freedom, equality, all in there. There's also the things that make development distinctively political. So concepts that we would use, um, things such as colonialism, interests, power, rules, ideas are all here um, in the way that these different programs and modules on the politics of development are described. There's also the, uh, the who as well. So civil society, um, states, military, also foreign aid, all um, either ciphers for or descriptions of the different actors involved. And then finally, there's the where it happens. So traditionally, obviously, development studies speaks to particular regions, um, so Africa and Asia here, but also part of uh, contemporary development studies and something we wanted to pick up in the book is to challenge this dichotomy of the developed developing world, which is not to say that the challenges of inequality and inclusion pertain to all countries the same everywhere. You can't be blind to power differentials, both international and opportunities and inequality. But nevertheless, we wanted to um, write it in such a way that um, it underlines the universal nature uh, of development. So the thing that, going back to the question about um, how do we convey what the politics of development is to a student, is there's a lot of diversity here. And diversity is great. Um, but one thing we wanted to do is try and come up with a usable, um, a specific, a contestable definition that's more than just kind of a collection of words such as this, this word cloud uh, would suggest. And what we wanted to do is define the politics of development into a composite definition that it was more than the sum of its parts, but wasn't just the idea that it was the use of political science to study development, but actually there was something um, something coherent uh, to it as, as a question or an approach. So on to the next slide here. And um, so first of all, here's the definition that we came up with, and we define the politics of development as the unavoidable process of contestation over alternative desired futures. So what do we mean by this? Well, development often has been described and thought of as good change, which is fine, but it obviously raises the question, it doesn't tell us what constitutes good, which aspects of change are good and how to bring it about and crucially good for who. And so this, this process of contestation over, you know, different versions of the way that things are or should be, what people believe is right or wrong, both for themselves or for society, what they need, what they value, or how they believe goods should be distributed. Um, it's the question of contesting those things that um, constitute the politics of development, that development is inherently political. There is no way of getting around that because it's all about who gets to decide, who gets to shape, um, who gets what, when and how. And so, the other good thing I think about this is it allows us to develop a much more positive and productive understanding of politics, which is another thing that we're keen to do with this book, that there's a very commonplace understanding of politics as being about corruption, venality, self-interest, opportunism, antisocial, corrosive of the common good. And that is a very negative idea of politics, but ne nevertheless, a very popular one. And of course, some of that is true, but it's also a partial view. And so what we wanted to convey here is that also that politics is about the art of getting things done. It's about compromise and it's about order. Um, so it's both the obstacle and the way. That's the way that we're thinking about politics here. So subsequent question is in this definition, why is it unavoidable? And we come up with three key points here. Um, first of all, and perhaps most straightforwardly, that actually there is a real diversity of people's interests, values, what people want, what their goals are and why. And so 
that because of that plurality of people's interests and viewpoints, it's impossible to avoid that process of contestation. Uh, secondly, um, the uh, is the idea that it's inevitable because there are a finite or a fixed set of resources, or at least the idea that that they are unevenly distributed across nations and peoples. And sometimes they are indeed dwindling supply, but the geographies of uneven distribution can be natural, but also are often very man-made and politically constructed. So most recently with the pandemic, I guess, with access to life-saving vaccines. And so this scarcity and inequality fuels those competing interests um, and those diversity of competing interests. And then the, finally, we point to the fact that there's never been a level playing field in the process of contesting power resources. And that's because of the history and the enduring legacies of colonization. And those legacies of trauma, injustice, structural inequality continue to shape contemporary contestation. And so they have to be recognized as well. Okay, and then third, where does it happen? Well, um, everywhere, um, whether it's in the household, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in international organizations, whether it's in society, um, basically uh, wherever two people come together and try to act collectively, we have politics unavoidably. So um, that then raises the question about how do we understand it? How do we understand how these political processes work out in all these different places and spaces? And for that, I'm gonna hand over to Samit. Thank you very much, David. Um, so definitions are important, but they can only take us so far. And the reason for that is that many of our readers, uh, our students, your students, will want to know about how they can think about or learn about the realities of challenges that face people's lives, the billions of people across the world. And so they want to get into what we would say are the practicalities of doing development and how to address those particular challenges of doing development. And so in this book, we apply a framework for analyzing the politics of development using what we call our three eyes. Uh, these three eyes, which you can see in a nice little graphic on your screen, um, are interests, institutions, interests, and ideas. So our three eyes are concepts that we are all familiar with, that we've all either been taught or, or teach ourselves, and they are entrenched and debated widely in the literature, um, sometimes separately and sometimes in an overlapping way across sociology, political science, economics, and other disciplines. What we are arguing for, though, is that there is potential for contestation across all three of these and between all three of them. And I think that's something that hopefully everyone can agree on with us when they read the book. So institutions are formal and informal rules for resource allocation that are being contested. And these rules or these institutions are being contested by more or less rational actors with competing interests. And those actors hold a range of ideas about what is right, fair, just. And so we have to look at all of these different moving parts together to find out how they are interlinked, how they work in practice, and how they are limited as explanations in and of themselves and how they must sort of rely on each other uh, for us to get a bigger picture of what is happening in the world in front of us. So the rules of the game uh, or institutions as we define them may structure decision-making and behaviors. So they may sort of uh, set out uh, the primary challenge of development as being about strong, building strong institutions, peaceful, prosperous, inclusive, and accountable institutions. And many authors have done that, whether it's Francis Fukuyama, Eleanor Ostrom, or Danny Roderick. But there are limits to this approach of thinking of institutions as the way. Um, and an important one is that institutions are very good at explaining continuity. So they're able to tell us why things remain the same but they are notoriously bad at explaining or accounting for change. So why do things change suddenly in a specific context? Why do the rules suddenly change? And this is why we feel we need to consider interests. So the reason interests are important is that rules don't make the rules themselves. People make the rules. And because people make the rules, we rely on Adrian Lefwich's idea, which is that uh, the idea of people playing games within the rules. So the rules of 
for example, chess or football or whatever game you like to uh, bear in mind, do not determine, determine the outcome of the game, but they shape the game itself. And to understand this, we need to understand agency and we need to understand where interests come from. So simply understanding interests in a rational choice frame is not enough either. So we can't just say that, well, people behave in their interests and that's it. To understand what those interests are and where they come from, we have to look at ideas. And human behavior is shaped by ideas. Ideas help us to figure out what is or what is not in our interests and how to get whatever we want uh, in terms of what we think is, to, is in our interests. So while it's essential to ask what different interests people have in certain outcomes, it leaves the question of why do people have preferences in the first instance? Why do they make certain choices about which rules to follow and which rules not to follow? And that's where um, the rest of the, the rest of the sort of chapters come into our story. Um, and hopefully on the screen, you can you can sort of see an image of the chapters that that form the book. And you can also go on the website and see a, a sort of a more detailed picture uh, with all of the different chapters that we have. Um, but what each of the chapters does, and it covers a lot of ground, they cover a lot of ground across identity, um, movements, donors, and so on, is how in practice does this framework help to understand the politics of development? So in this third part of the book, we apply key everyday questions that ordinary people or your students and our students think about when they think about the politics of development. So sometimes these questions are provocative and we've, we've designed them that way so that they can provoke um, sort of a discussion in your classrooms, uh, but they're also everyday questions. So something, you know, we all ask ourselves, I think at some point, uh, why doesn't everyone get the same? Um, how can I jump this queue? Uh, can the planet cope with development? These are simple questions because they're everyday questions, but they are intellectually and in the real world for our students, for us, challenging to answer and they set up the fundamentals of the work that we do. So in chapter 12, just to take one example, uh, we ask how the three eyes help us to understand the motivations for engaging in bribe paying so, or, or versus bribe seeking behavior. So we are trying to understand why clientelism persists um, whether this is good or bad for development and trying to look at different perspectives uh, from all across the world with examples from all across the world of, of how uh, clientelism shapes development. So applying the framework of the three eyes allows us to bring a lot of different disciplinary perspectives uh, to the different puzzles in each of the chapters. Um, and so what we're able to do is bring different disciplines into conversation with each other and understand why solutions that do not in turn acknowledge the multidimensional nature of these puzzles will likely fail. So if you're trying to say that institutions are the solution, then you may not have a fuller picture because you're not looking at ideas and you're not looking at interests. So for example, why do anti-corruption campaigns uh, have unintended consequences sometimes? Um, and this can be because they get their message wrong, it could be for other reasons, but we have to understand that introducing an institution um, with regard to corruption is not is not uh, necessarily the solution to the problem of corruption. So in effect, um, this is how we think about the book and this is how we think it can scaffold critical reflection and action, not just in classrooms, but hopefully also outside of it as well. Um, there are other ways, however, of thinking through the framework and the book's content. Um, and I'm gonna hand over to Nick, who will speak a bit more about that. Hi, everyone. Thanks to my colleagues and thanks so much for, you for all coming. It's wonderful to have so many people on the call. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, what does the book do for students and what does it do for teachers? Why is it a useful book to have in your classroom? And we think the book will be really useful for students and teachers alike because it was written with teaching and communication in mind. This is really a book that was co-produced in the classroom with students of very mixed abilities and very mixed backgrounds. So it's been designed to be easy to read and understand, to really cut through for students of all abilities, but also to have some sections that will stretch and reward the more advanced students. The book builds on years of experience of those within our department, 
both in terms of their experience of teaching those students of different abilities, but also in terms of time on the ground in very different parts of the world, in Africa, in Asia, the Pacific and parts of Latin America. And I think one of the bits of the book that I'm most proud of is that we genuinely have examples from everywhere. You often see a textbook that actually reflects the bias of the author of the textbook and is mostly about one part of the world. I think that's really not true of this book, and that's quite exciting. Coming out of a mixed methods and a diverse team of researchers, we also hope that the book is a really interdisciplinary one. It's rooted in development studies, but bringing out consistently lessons from other parts of academia, from political science, from development economics, in some cases from anthropology, to provide a really rounded understanding of what is going on in the politics of development today. We also wanted really to be able to provide a book that is as much uh, more effective because it is rooted in the student experiences. And as Claire said, one of the things we've constantly done is given chapters and sections of the book to our students and ask them to point out which bits of it were harder to understand, which bits didn't make sense, which bits were the most engaging. And the book has really benefited from that. Next slide, please. So the structure of the book um, is set up to provide a coherent integrated account of the politics of development. It's formed around a binding framework of institutions, interests and ideas, and you could see that here. It's therefore ideal to be used as a textbook, and we have deliberately included more weeks than you would normally have, or more topics than you would have weeks in a normal course, to enable you to choose the topics and issues that will be most interesting to you and most interesting to the students. And the book is actually designed as a course might be designed, so bringing you from part one to part four, through the understanding of the key concepts, then developing some of the key theory and ideas that structure the book, and then providing practical examples. So what does that look like? Well, first of all, we set out the understanding of the politics of development in part one. We explain why all development is political. We also look at how knowledge about development is produced. As Claire has said already, many of our students are increasingly interested in who is writing these stories and why. Rather than sidestepping this discussion, we really wanted to discuss who has produced the most widely read work on development and what does that mean for our understanding of it? That's an issue to which I'm going to return in just a minute. In part two, we look at the foundations for our understanding, interests, institutions and ideas that Samin has already set out. We explore these three eyes of politics of development in greater depth, devoting a chapter to each one, really analysing and illustrating the strengths and limitations of their explanatory power and why we think we need all of them and an integrated understanding to understand how the politics of development and contestation works on a day to day basis. And these individual chapters really enable students to understand exactly how these different lenses work and the pros and cons of using each of them. And therefore the value of integrating them into understandings. What we're then able to do in parts three and four is to show students practical examples of what can be done if you bring these three different lenses together. So in part three, we look at change makers, governments, markets, people and donors. And we're really interested in here in scrutinizing the ideas and the interests that are held by some of the most important actors uh, involved in development today asking what motivations they have, what power they have, and how the organizational structures they operate within either constrain or facilitate their actions. In part three, uh, part four, sorry, therefore the challenges, the politics of development from the ground up, we apply the three eyes to analyze the processes of contestation around the world, looking at the sorts of challenges that people face on the ground. As with all of the book, we try and root this in the experiences that people have on a day-to-day -day basis as they seek to get by and get ahead. And we conclude that with a discussion of different forms of contestation, including when contestation turns violent. Next slide, please. So we think there are four key pedagogical features of the book that run through all of the chapters and ensure it has a common voice. And that's one thing that I think is really important to say. The great thing about the book is it brings in very many different diverse voices, but in a sense, the tone, the structure, the language is very consistent throughout. And there were four things that I think I would highlight here. The first is research-led teaching. 
Uh, we think that the way that the book has been written really brings the topics to life through latest research development and the state of knowledge. So it enables students to feel that they're really at the frontier of the discipline right now, thinking and asking the same questions as those people who are actually writing their books and their articles. It's theory informed, but it is not theory dominated. Each chapter is anchored in different theoretical constructs that are summarized in concept boxes that show the development of a theoretical field, as well as some of the challenges to the orthodoxy. But the chapters don't force students to read pages and pages of dry theory, because we know this is often a massive turn off to students who don't particularly like that way of learning. Instead, we're constantly providing recent real world examples to explain and illustrate key ideas in ways that we think students find much more intuitive and enjoyable, effectively teaching them the same things, but in a much more participatory and engaging way. Third, the book is inherently problem driven. As you can see from the questions on the previous slide, we're teaching the conventional things you would expect to find in a development textbook, but from the perspective of asking key questions about them and engaging students in actually thinking them through themselves. Put another way, the book has been written not to present one way of thinking or to provide simple resolutions to really intractable debates, but rather to encourage students to critically evaluate different ways of thinking and the conclusions that these ways of thinking might lead to. We also encourage students to understand the nuances of the real world and to think about the way that different programs or policies might have both positive and negative outcomes at the same time. Part of this critical approach is to encourage students to puzzle things out for themselves. We appreciate that students often need a lot of guidance and we make sure that they get that, but we also want to encourage them in the learning process and engage them in the learning process. So this is one of the reasons why we ask students a set of thought provoking critical questions as they read the book, which also provide useful material for classroom debates, interactive exercises, and ultimately assessments for those who are doing the teaching. In the spirit of contestation, we also encourage readers to engage with, reflect on, accept, or potentially object to the material they find in the book. This means that in addition to receiving clear guidance on critical issues, students are constantly encouraged to critically consider our arguments and our examples and how far they apply to their own existence and experiences. A critical uh, example of this is helping, to think, helping students to think through the politics of knowledge. So as I previewed above, this book aims to anchor the politics of development in the day-to-day -day experiences of citizens. But we all know that legacies of power and knowledge asymmetries necessarily limit this pursuit in practice, particularly the degree to which the voices of the most marginalized are represented on their own terms. We acknowledge this in the book and we encourage students to do the same. This is why one of the most important inclusions in the book from our perspective is a chapter on whose knowledge counts. This situates the book in a critical assessment of how scholars can even claim to know these things. Who holds power in claim making? Who writes? the politics of development and why. It would be unthinkable today to not ground a book about politics uh, of development in an appreciation of the politics of knowledge because historical legacies and global inequalities have generated knowledge asymmetries that have profoundly shaped whose everyday lived realities are represented and on whose terms. And this is something that we increasingly find students raising on their own in our classrooms. We therefore find that this approach is useful, not only because it respects and listens to what students are interested in today, but also because it empowers students to be more vocal in class and more likely to want to suggest their own takes rather than simply wanting to be provided with the right answer. Next slide, please. So this is a book about the politics of development that is fit for purpose in 2024. It's a book that reflects many of the key debates of our time in a way students will find exciting and engaging, and which we think they'll also find easy to understand. It's a book that encourages engagement, and we hope that students will find it easy to read. It encourages them to ask the right questions, and also to understand that the politics of development is something that matters for all of us. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening to our presentation. Again, we don't take your presence for granted. We're really grateful to have you here. 
Uh, you know, you were reminded of this in the beginning, uh, but just to remind you again, uh, for this webinar function, please put your questions in the Q&A box. You'll find that at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I, we've already got a great question here from Isaac, which I'm going to read out to the panel in a minute. And I see one from Shafat. So thank you so much. Uh, please, if you have more, uh, do come in. I'm going to ask these questions and then encourage others from the panel to answer them, as well as some questions we got from people who've registered for this event and sent in questions in advance. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so quickly for Isaac's question, uh, Isaac says, in other words, can we say that the that politics can be seen in the participatory approaches to development? If so, how can politics be a driver for development itself? And I know that's something that my colleagues Claire and David and others will be interested in because we often talk about in this book how politics is both the challenge for development in many cases, but also therefore must be to an extent the solution. We also have a question here which says, I wonder if your discussion also looks at the role of faith actors or religious motivations in shaping contesting developments on the ground. My question emerges at the backdrop of increasing influence of religion in the global south in everyday development activities and humanitarian practices. And Samin, I'm wondering if you might want to take that one. So I'll let you guys respond to those two, and then I'll start feeding in some of the questions we had that were sent in before. And as I say, please do add more questions and we will answer as many as we can today. So David or Claire, do you want to unmute yourself and answer the first one of those? And then I'll come to Samin to unmute herself for the second. I'm happy to have a first shot, if that's good, yeah. Um, so yeah, great. I'll go for uh, Isaac's question then, which is, uh, as Nick said, a, a really good question. And the short answer is yes, but that's, that's the uninteresting part, right? Um, so that's the perspective that we're trying to say that politics is everywhere and it can be a positive drive uh, for development. In fact, it's necessary. But one of the chapters, chapter eight there is called power to the people question mark. And it's all about social movements, popular participation and deepening democracy um, written by our colleagues, Chris Lyon and Ellie Chowns. And in that they do, I think, they, they tackle your question um, head on and ask using the three eyes, like what is the role of ideas in, um, in participatory approaches? So it can be both a, again, a positive force that, that, that people want to come together and work towards something. It's also the values um, that people hold who are participating, but also negatively around sometimes social norms that uh, exclude certain groups um, from fully participating, whether that's on the grounds of caste or on the grounds of gender, for example, and what is seen as appropriate behaviour. And then, of course, the institutions that exist allow certain people to reinforce those norms because the rules of the game, as uh, Samin said, are the things that help shape um, who gets to participate and who gets excluded and reinforce those. So, yes, the answer is absolutely. Um, but then hopefully and um, uh, the, the framework that we introduce at the beginning of the book, which then in all of these individual chapters, including the one that I just mentioned, gets applied, allows us to understand a little bit more about um, outcomes in different places, whether it be Sao Paulo um, or whether it be um uh, manchester so thanks so much david samin do you want to come in there on the one about the significance of religious motivations in shaping contesting development on the ground yeah i think it's a really great great question shafat thank you very much um i think if you look at the table of contents you won't see religion or faith as as terms that are used in any of the headings but um, it's something that I think comes up when we discuss, for example, uh, institutions, interests, and ideas. So um, even if we don't specifically refer to, um, you know, specific religions or specific faith actors, I think what we do in the book is provide you with a framework to apply the ideas that we have, the framework that we have set out to any particular context that you have in mind. So what you might do is take the interest uh, institutions and ideas framework and apply it to the context that you're thinking of and consider how religious ideas or religious motivations um, may fit into um, institutions, interests and ideas and see how that helps you understand what is happening on the ground in the countries uh, in the global south that you are referring to 
and the behavior that you're referring to. Um, I think there's there's also other chapters that you might find interesting or relevant. So there's a chapter on when do people accept authority, and and I think legitimacy is a huge part of faith, of religious belief of faith, um, and I think you might find that chapter interesting as well. So I think there's lots of um, different bits of the book that you will find interesting and you'll find it interesting in applying it to the context that you're very familiar with. So even if we don't specifically say, oh, this is about religion or this is about faith um, in the in the contents or, or even in, you know, sort of necessarily all the chapters, you might find a lot of material that you can use to think through how faith plays a role. Thanks so much, I mean, Okay, I'm going to start throwing a few more questions at you guys. So really nice question here from Ayo. Thanks, Ayo. Uh, what are the pedagogical challenges in teaching the politics of development? If it's okay, Claire, I'm going to send that one your way. Uh, we have a question here from Joyce. Thank you so much, Joyce. Uh, what would you suggest for readings, assignments uh, that on issues related to the politics of development that are accessible for under, undergraduates? Uh, thanks so much for that question. One thing I really wanted to communicate, and I think it's it's a really nice thing, is that you know one of the things we produce, of course, at the end of each chapter is a really good suggested reading list. And we've deliberately chosen for that list things that are uh, really accessible for undergraduates and master's students. So if you're interested in that, please do pick up a copy of the book, look at the suggested readings, and it will really help you out with that task. Okay, question for me at the University of Birmingham. Wonderful to have someone from the University of Birmingham on the line. Uh, how do you see the intersection of gender norms with the politics of development and what is the best way to address these as development practitioners? That's a nice question about the intersection of ideas in, in formal institutions and formal institutions. Perhaps, David, I'll push that one to you if that's okay. Um, and then um, let me check if we've got any more questions we should be answering right now. Uh, here's an interesting one that we might be able to take between us, Samin, we could have a go. Uh, so two final questions for this round uh, from uh, somebody from Kenya, which is wonderful. Hi, my friends in Kenya. Uh, please, could you speak about the role of philanthropy in politics and whether impartiality is a realistic goal in funding development? Uh, and one more for this round, uh, Isaac in Nairobi. Nice to see another person from Kenya. With the prevailing interference of politics and development, what can be done to strengthen the instruments of development moving forwards? Thanks, Isaac. OK, so perhaps we'll go to Claire first, then David, then Samin, and maybe I will have a go at some of those ones that have just come in at the very end of that. Uh, over to you, Claire. Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. I don't think I can answer all of those questions, but maybe one at a time. So I'll start with the philanthrop uh, sorry, the pedagogy, which is a really, a really great one. And in fact, um, was really the motivation behind the book, um, because we started out with an undergraduate program in the politics of development um, and then kind of had to look around for the material that was out there that could help us to teach this. Um, and we learned through um, a classroom experience how 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 challenging that actually is I think some of the some of the challenges are general which are just you know students want to connect with the material they want to have uh, be able to kind of relate to it they it needs to be real it needs to relate to lived experiences especially those programs and I know many many of the the teachers um and educators in this space will have experience of diverse classrooms, lots of different lived experiences. Um, so how, how do you teach development, the politics of development in ways that kind of can incorporate that diversity of experience um, and, and bring that into the classroom? I think some of the challenges with teaching the politics of development are specific. They're about the disciplinary silos that tend to get uh, brought into teaching. So you might have a week where you bring an economics lens or a week when you bring a sociological lens or a week when you look at gender. And I think what we're trying to do is kind of break down those silos. And instead of looking at um, particular lenses and starting from there, actually looking at particular global challenges, inequality, poverty, social injustice, climate, crisis example and then trying to bring this coherent framework that can capture all these disciplinary perspectives into that i think a really important part of that and something we do in each chapter of the book is we will always start with a vignette a story someone somewhere in the world who is experiencing 
the stuff that we want to talk about, right? So we don't start with fear, we, we completely flip it. So we will start with, here's a scenario, this person is living out this daily reality, they're being blocked from accessing vital public goods, or they're experiencing um, inequality in, in, in the way that they want to thrive and survive in their lives. Um, so how can we analyze this productively through that, through that interdisciplinary lens? And I think that is for us a really important part of trying to overcome this pedagogical challenge of um, bringing empathy into this space and connecting the teaching of politics of development with lived reality and the diversity of lived reality. That's my answer to that, Nick. Great answer. Thanks so much, Claire. David, could we come to you on the interesting question about gender norms? Yeah, absolutely. So a great question from Mia there. Um, and I think I think there's two two parts to it. So the first part was about how the how gender norms intersect with the rest of the stuff of the politics of development. And then the second half was about how can practitioners um apply these insights. So the on the first one, um, as Nick was showing with the um contents page then we've written, and as Samim was documenting, we've written about institutions, ideas, and interests in separate chapters. But there's an awful lot of uh, conversation between them because they all interact with one another. They're not necessarily purely separate things. So when you think of social norms, they are institutionalized ideas. When you think of interests, well, interests come out of the kind of interaction between ideas that people have um, both in their head and about the world and also those those rules that exist out in the world. And so bringing the three eyes into conversation with one another is always the answer, uh, um, the way that we set it out. So that's the best way uh, of answering that first part of the question, I think, it's looking at how the bits where they overlap with one other to produce particular outcomes. In terms of how practitioners can use it, I actually think it's an incredibly practical um, approach. And uh, many of us have a background in doing kind of the uh, political economy analysis that is very much beloved of uh, policymakers and practitioners in trying to understand kind of the political uh, landscape that um, that uh, whether they are donors or whether they are um, activists are working in and mapping out that landscape of, well, who are the stakeholders? What are the uh, interests that they have? What are the ideas that exist um, within society that make certain uh, opportunities or initiatives or pathways more or less likely to succeed or fail? And what is the institutional context that all of these stakeholders and actors are working in? And so I think it's both a very, it's theoretically got a good, very strong tradition, institutions, interests and ideas. They've got very long ped pedigree i was going to say pedagogy we talk about pedagogy pedigree um in the intellectual um and academic sphere but actually they are very well used by practitioners and policymakers so i think you can take them off the shelf and in some ways the book has is meant to be a toolkit as well a toolkit that people can use to apply and understand and indeed help change the world so that's a good line to finish on Definitely. Yeah. And I think it will be a really useful guide for policymakers who often say, you know, can you give me something that really, you know, explains to me what the challenge here is, but is not one of your, you know, very convoluted, highly quantitative academic papers. It's harder for me to understand. And I think the the chapters of the book really, you know, are nice responses to that. Right. They they provide great overviews of important issues, but they're in a sense going to be as useful, I think, for policymakers as for students. Samin, is it OK to come to you now? Yeah, I think you gave me the question on philanthropy, am I right? Yes, if that's yeah. okay. Um, so a really interesting question. And I think this is one of those sort of topics that I think is going to become more and more relevant as the years go on. So it's a really important question to ask. Um, I think I'm offering more of my personal view here because I think philanthropy has a place in the sense that it addresses some issues um, at speed or targets funding in particular areas. But I think philanthropy cannot solve 
problems that are structural. It can't solve problems that can only be dealt with uh, by states. Uh, so philanthropy is not a solution or the solution by any means to development problems. Um, and part of the reason I say that is the second part of your question, which is about impartiality. Um, philanthropy is not impartial. It can't be impartial unless um, people who are advocating for a framework that includes interests, ideas, and institutions, interests and ideas and institutions operate in philanthropy as well. So we have to think about whether philanthropic organizations or individuals, um, what, what are the drivers behind their behavior, whether those are institutional interest-based um, or idea-based. And I think that that kind of um, does away with the impartiality um, perspective on, on development funding in general. And I don't think, personally, I don't think that that's some, something that can be aimed for because if any, if you ask any realistic practitioner or development, they will say it's not possible to be completely impartial because everyone has certain biases that they bring into the field that they bring into their work. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a personal take on it. Um, um, I'm not sure if we necessarily reference philanthropic organizations in the book. Um, I think they do probably come up somewhere. Um, there, um, I don't know if you remember where. Um, They're in the um, donors chapter. There's some discussion. There you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so you will find some discussion of philanthropic actors in the donors chapter. Uh, Great. Thanks so much. And just on, on where to find interesting things in the book, Emika, our brilliant colleague, has chimed in. Thank you, Emika, to say, you know, on, on the religious point, check it, check out our chapter, Why My Identity Matters, uh, where we delve into how religious institutions frequently perpetuate uh, different ideas, including heteronormativity, neglecting diverse genders and sexualities. So uh, thank you very much, Emika. And yeah, that's absolutely right. There's a lot of really rich discussion of that in the book. Now, we have a few more questions and we don't have too much time, so I'll, I'll read out a few of them and then I might try and answer a couple myself that focus on Africa and I'll kick the rest of the panel. So Adnan's got a great question here, uh, which might be for you, Samin, or you, Claire. Uh, thank you for what is clearly going to be an impactful text. Thank you very much. That's a kind comment. My question relates to the Three Eyes framework. It is presented as a sequence where ideas are the ultimate drivers of interests and ultimately institutional change and therefore development. If this follows, is it true that essentially this is a battle of ideas and therefore we can see the politics of development as the politics of ideas? I think this is great. We should actually also have that for um, an essay question for our students. Yeah. yeah. But brilliant question. So I'll let, I'll let uh, Samino Claire perhaps come in on that one. Uh, Linda, is that Linda from Zimbabwe, I wonder if it is? Hi, Linda. Um, how does your book address the role of women in the political conversation? I would want to understand how we can speak of development when the greater population, oh, which is women, are not as active and participate less. Can we say that there is a politics of development when we have a large number of women lagging behind in political con uh, conversations? Um, and we have a question over here that I've seen, I think, from... Solomon, who says, you know, can politics in a enhance sustainable development in Africa? Solomon coming in from Uganda. So great to have such a strong East African representation today. Thanks, Solomon. Um, and then I think we had Isaac's question before about, you know, with the prevailing interference of politics and development, what can be done to strengthen the instruments of development? So, perhaps, you know, perhaps a couple of thoughts here, Linda. One of the things that is in the book a lot and we have worked on as a team and individually is the politics of gender. Um, I've done a lot of work in large parts of Africa on, for example, the use of gender quotas to try and promote women in politics and the conditions under which women are able to actually take a greater role uh, in the political debate and in which they're able to that actually shape that. We also show the way in the book that many of the outcomes of development programs and initiatives are gendered and the significance of institutional and ideational legacies in that. So I think there's a lot in the book that you know feeds into what you're talking about. And the book is very clear about the gendered nature of the politics of development and the consequences of that for women in different parts of the world. So I think you'd find that some of your the things that you're interested in are here. In terms of Isaac's question about the role of the culture of politics and the culture of politics in Africa potentially uh, being a challenge, I think that's a really good question. Uh, and I think it's something, again, that there's really interesting material on in the book. So, for example, one of our colleagues, Kate Proust, has a really nice section in one of the chapters where she looks at the role of different kinds of norms and understandings of who is deserving, who is not deserving. 
and how that shapes how people are access to actually able to get you know social welfare and provision from the government we also look in the book at different ideas about equality does a society believe that equality is important or do they actually believe that wealth is valuable and that poverty is in somehow a moral and therefore that wealth accumulation is justified even if it creates vast inequalities that's perhaps a predominant political culture in some parts of east africa and that then changes the nature of the politics of development in terms of actually delivering key public services and steps that might be taken to make politics less equal so we talk about those things very much head on about the interaction of those norms and those institutions and how they shape the politics of development and then we try and talk about what the sorts of solutions to that might be but again, as David, I think, was saying earlier, we try not to be too prescriptive. We try not to tell people what all of those answers are, but to show what some of the answers might be and what some of the pros and cons are. And so a lot of the chapters are quite practical and do try and talk about how can we try and respond to some of the key development traps. And I think you'll find a lot of interest there. So uh, I think we had a fine a question there, um, this question about ideas and the sequencing. I was thinking, uh, Samin, you presented that slide, but Claire, of course, this is also a framework that you've helped to develop. So perhaps you two want to take that one. And then I think we've got most of the questions. Oh, I see a couple more right at the bottom. Okay, well, maybe I'll just come in and quickly say 30 seconds on Adnan's brilliant question, which... Um which is why this webinars like this are so great because they make you reflect on the way you present visuals. And I recognize that we presented it as interests, institutions and ideas in quite a linear fashion. Actually, that's not really how we think of it. We think of it more as a Venn diagram, more of a kind of overlap, overlapping set of um, constructs, if you like. So um, the, the beauty of having ideas is that we, we I think we do feel that ideas are underrepresented as a political motive, as a political driver of development processes and as a driver of contestation. So bringing ideas into that kind of re I framework was really important. It's not all about ideas, though. In, it's about the interconnections between them. So, of course, institutions shape interests. Interests are ultimately formed through our ideas. But you could also say that institutions are just embedded ideas, particularly well embedded sets of ideas. So it's it's in the kind of dynamic interrelationship between the three eyes that we feel development can be understood and the politics of development can be understood. And that's why we think we need all of them. So in future presentations, that will be a circle, not a line. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think um, it's a fair fair takeaway considering the way we presented it, because especially because they were presented in the explanation as feeding out of each other. But I think you know the 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 politics of ideas will will sort of when you start thinking about it, will lead you back to interests and institutions, so you can't escape them. Um, so it's not that it's it's one or the other or one of the three is somehow hierarchically higher because once you once you start getting into the weeds of a specific case. You uh, you find that it you can't ascribe um, the reasons for behavior or for action to one of these uh, specific eyes. So I think um, even if you wanted to to say that ideas are important, which I agree with with uh, Claire that they are, um, you could end up saying something like contestation over ideas, and then where does that contestation come from, right? So so you, so you you end up as Claire has just said going in circles. So which is a nice thing in 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 this particular case at least. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, I mean, yeah. So great questions, really nice questions. Um, just Ahmed, you know, lovely question there about um, you know the frameworks of the book. I think David's sending you an answer there, so you'll get a typed answer in a second. We are going to have to close, unfortunately, uh, because we have come to time. But thanks so much to everyone, Neo. Thanks to your question about uh, populism and whether populism has ever done anything good. I would say in general, no. But perhaps under Zambia, in Zambia, under Michael Sada. Uh, the Patriotic Front government did at the beginning increase spending on things like education, and we could see, therefore, that a populist movement actually led to some improvement. So there's something there that we could say that might be positive. But we'll try and respond to some of those questions in a longer form, a uh, written version, uh, because we are out of time. Thank you once again for coming, and thank you for so many good questions. And I'll hand back to Fozia and Sage uh, to round off the event. Thanks so much. So thank you. I would just want to repeat my thanks to you that that was a very thought provoking, very illuminating discussion. And thank you so much for your time and for um, presenting the um, webinar today and for, you know, taking all those questions, both 
the ones that came in advance and the ones live. Um, if we didn't get around to answering uh, any questions today, um, we will follow up with them offline and we'll share them um, later on with you. So do keep your eyes peeled on the Sage um, Twitter page, oh, X page, sorry. Um, so just a quick one, um, on the next slide, you're going to see a QR code with the link to our web page where you can find out more about the book. Um, and also there's a, a discount code of 25% for anybody who attended today's webinar. So if you use that poll web week discount code, um, you can get 25% off if you want to buy the book or if you're a lecturer or a module leader, you can get an inspection copy as well. So the webinar will is is recorded so we're going to share the recording over the next couple of weeks so you can watch it again or do share it with any colleagues who may be interested and just to wrap up now i just want to say a huge huge thank you to claire david samin and nick for their time today and for that very thought-provoking discussion thank you to georgina for helping to facilitate the webinar behind the scenes and thank you for everyone who joined us today um goodbye thank you